This lesson is going to introduce the physiology of selective filtration. We gave you the anatomy towards the beginning of the module. We've discussed the mechanisms of filtration forces, why things do move, but we haven't talked about how or why things don't all move from the capillary into Bowman space. We're going to talk about the filtration slits first. And we're going to do it in a way that's going to enable us then to discuss nephritic and nephrotic syndromes. The following two lessons that conclude the injury series are titled, one, nephrotic syndrome, two, nephritic syndrome. Students have a lot of trouble with this because they differ by one letter. They both involve the glomerulus and they both have light microscopy, electron microscopy, and immunofluorescence, which seem to overlap. They overlap only if you don't see the clinical syndrome. So in this lesson, we're going to talk about nephrotic syndrome light and nephritic syndrome light. I'm going to show you that they are not related in any way. They are by a kidney biopsy, they are by their name, but not in their presentation. You will not have to compare nor contrast nephritic or nephrotic syndrome. You won't have to decide which one is it. They are completely distinct. So let's talk about the barrier to filtration first. Before we do that, I'm just going to remind you of some of the stuff that you've heard me say a bunch of times and already know, but it's important for this discussion. Afferent arteriole comes in, forms peritubular capillaries. Peritubular capillaries come back together to form the efferent arteriole, which then gives rise to the capillary bed of the peritubular capillaries. High pressure system, 50 millimeters of mercury, ensures that the hydrostatic pressure of the capillary always favors filtration. Filtration, the definition, is moving things from the capillary to Bowman space. Now we know what normally gets filtered. If we need it, we need to resorb it. Water gets filtered, moves from the capillary lumen into Bowman space, but then is resorbed. Ions and other small molecules also get filtered and get resorbed. Amino acids, glucose. What does not normally get filtered is protein. Protein does not filter. And these are large proteins, not individual amino acids. And if you have a good GFR, there's good flow through this system. And the macula densa assesses this system. If there's good flow, it pushes the Katrina switch up to off. If there's not good flow through the system, it falls to on, which makes renin. Favors filtration. And this is sort of the wrong way people teach this stuff. The glomerular capillary is designed to filter. Most capillaries are designed to filter and absorb. Some capillaries are kept super tight so that nothing can get through, like the blood-brain barrier. The glomerular capillary is constructed so that it is enabled to push water, ions, and small molecules out of the capillary and into Bowman space. It is not supposed to restrict anything. This arrangement exists between a, an endothelial cell an endothelial cell has large fenestrations in it. Most endothelial cells do not have large fenestrations in them. Those endothelial cells restrict everything. These fenestrations are about 75 nanometers. Endothelial cells normally restrict the movement of water, ions, and small molecules. The endothelial cells of the glomerular capillary have an additional appendage called a fenestration that permits things from the lumen to reach the basement membrane. The basement membrane is what the endothelial cell sits on. It's a loose collagenous matrix. It doesn't filter anything. On the other side 
of the basement membrane that shares the same basement membrane as the endothelial cell is the podocyte. And the podocyte has its cell body out in Bowman space, and it sends primary projections, which then release secondary projections. And these are supposed to be disappearing underneath the basement membrane. I'm not, this is very difficult to do a 3D drawing using a whiteboard and a whiteboard marker, and I'm not that good of a drawer. From the other side are come the interdigitating secondary processes, which are going to come up from underneath the basement membrane as well. And what you get are these little gaps in between foot processes. In between pedicles is about 35 nanometers. Albumin is a protein that is not supposed to be in the filtrate. Albumin is 15 nanometers. The fenestrations in the endothelium allow molecules smaller than 75 nanometers to get to the basement membrane, which allows molecules smaller than 75 nanometers to reach the foot processes, the pedicles of podocytes. The space between the pedicles, where they interdigitate, is too big to restrict albumin. It's smaller than the, the fenestrations of the endothelium, but it's too big to do anything. People call these filtration slits. Those are not the filtration slits. The spaces between foot processes are where the filtration slits are. What I want you to do is imagine looking down from the capillary lumen through one of these fenestrations. You are looking at the board. The endothelial cell is sitting here with a fenestration all the way through to the basement membrane. We're looking up underneath at these foot processes as they interdigitate. And then we're gonna pick them up and show you what it looks like. <clears throat> this is a foot process. This is a foot process. This is a foot process. On the plasma membrane, is a molecule called podocin. Podocin anchors this thing I'm about to describe intercellularly to actin filaments. Now, this is obviously more complicated than this, but the only two molecules I want you to learn are podocin and nephrin. From these podocin molecules, which are anchoring the structure down to the plasma membrane of interdigitated podocytes, is another protein called nephrin. These nephrin bridges do all of the selective filtration. And just to give you the idea here, you're going to have nephrin bridges between foot processes. If you look at this on two dimensions, like on an electron microscopy, what you're going to see is that the podocyte is going to have regular interdigitations with the basement membrane. The space between foot processes is where the nephrin bridges are. In podocyte effacement, what happens is that there's still these foot processes. Now they're all smushed and deformed, but the problem isn't that the podocyte pro foot processes are messed up, it's that the space that would normally be provided for the nephrin bridges is taken up by something else. And by taking it up for something else, the complex and delicate nephrin bridge arrangement that does selective filtration can't form. The nephrin bridges are the selective filtration. Selective filtration is done by having a positive charge and by being small, restricting anything less than 10 nanometers. 
The reason why albumin can't get through all of this is because of the nephrin bridge. Nephrin restricts albumin. This is what we just learned to talk about nephrotic syndrome light. This is just an introduction. We have the entire next lesson dedicated to nephrotic syndrome. <clears throat> In nephrotic syndrome, which is synonymous with podocyte effacement on electron microscopy, is what I just drew here. This is loss of the filtration slits. Normally, water filtered and reabsorbed. Ions filtered, reabsorbed. Proteins are restricted by the filtration slits. If you lose the filtration slit, and that's all that happens, consider what's going to happen here at the glomerulus. Water is going to be filtered. Ions are going to be filtered. They always are. Then the thing that was previously restricted is now unrestricted. <clears throat> Have we said anything about GFR, peritubular capillaries, resorption, or epithelium? We have not. Which means that everything else just functions. Which means that the ions that got filtered get resorbed. The water that got filtered gets resorbed. But proteins, too big, and they're not supposed to be in here, don't know how to get out. And so that results in proteinuria. Proteinuria means loss of protein into the urine. Now because GFR is not impaired, renal blood flow is good, GFR is maintained, which means the creatinine does not change, which means urine volumes are normal. And so if a little bit of protein is filtered all the time, but the person keeps up normal urine volumes, normal urine flow rates, what's going to happen is a lot of protein is going to get lost. Nephrotic range proteinuria is greater than 3.5 grams per day. It's time per day because they're going to urinate the same amount of volume and lose a little bit of protein as they do, there's going to be a lot of protein over the day. See why I make such a big deal about this when we talk about nephrotic syndrome. The rest of nephrotic syndrome has to do with the loss of protein. If you have albuminuria, you're losing protein into the urine, you're going to have hypoalbuminemia, low albumin. Albumin drives oncotic pressure in every blood vessel everywhere. So if you lose that oncotic pressure, you're going to present with edema. But not just edema, because it's every blood vessel everywhere, you get fluid everywhere, and that's called anasarca. And then something we'll discuss in a little bit more detail in the next lesson that's dedicated to nephrotic syndrome, the third part of the syndrome is hypercholesteremia. <clears throat>